what I saw during this uh, song, I saw a proud mother right here. She was just beaming, even though her face is covered with the mask. But we're all proud of you, amen? It's, uh, we all know Michaela since she was a little girl, and now she's uh, you know, here singing up front. It's, it's great to see you once again. I said last Sabbath, it's amazing. I love seeing young people up front, and that's what we need. So thank you for that amazing reminder to us today. Well, <clears throat> the sermon this morning I entitled A Comforting Rod. I know uh, after last week's sermon, I needed something that it's a little bit less, you know, <laughs> controversial, more, you know, encouraging to you. And I wanted to speak about this um, word of encouragement today. In the face of all the darkness that we are, um, you know, facing today in our lives, I'd like to give you this word of encouragement that comes from Psalm chapter 23, verse 1 to 4. Darkness makes us fearful because of the inability to see and know where the danger is. And we face a lot of darkness, a lot of dark valleys today, don't we? Um, you know, I talk to a lot of people uh, on the phone and, and visit them w- with them through Zoom. And, and I can tell you, and you know it very well, there is a lot of darkness out there um, in our personal lives in our families, and most of all in our society. There is a lot of darkness out there. And so we need that word of encouragement that comes from the word of God. People are afraid of darkness. It's because it is the unseen and the unknown uh, that really scares people, makes them uh, afraid. And so we're facing some uh, uncertain and unknown times right now, and, and so we're all frightened and we're, we're all scared and fear comes into our lives and then fear takes the joy away from, from us and fear takes away the, the ability to serve God and serve others. And, and that, that's Satan's agenda, to take that joy away from us. And so um, most of you remember when you were little kids, most of you probably were afraid of the dark, right? <laughs> to be by yourself in the dark room, uh, a lot of kids are afraid of that. Um, and uh, I read this illustration about a, a little boy being afraid of, of the dark. And one night his mother told him to go out to the back porch and bring her the broom that she left outside. Now, it was really pitch dark outside, and he was so afraid to go out there. And he said, a uh, little boy turned to his mother and said, Mama, I don't want to go out there. It's dark, and I'm really afraid. The mother smiled reassuringly at her her son. He said, you don't have to be afraid, she says. Um, You don't have to be afraid of the dark. Jesus is there in the dark with you. He'll look after you and he'll protect you. Have you told your kids something like that sometimes? (laughs) When your kids are afraid, yeah. We all tell our kids that. And the little boy looked at his mother real hard and asked the question, are you sure he's out there? Like any little boy would do. Uh, yes, I'm sure, she said. He's everywhere, and he's always ready to help you and, and protect you whenever you need him. The little boy thought about that for a minute and then went to the back door and cracked a little bit the door, and he peered out into the darkness. And he called, said, Jesus. He says, if you're out there, please, would you please hand me the broom? <laughs> Being afraid of the dark of darkness. When we talk about darkness and being afraid and fear of darkness, Psalm 23, 1 to 4 comes to mind as the encouragement to us to face that darkness. And let's read it together again. Open with you, please, your Bibles to Psalm chapter 24, and we will read verses 1 to 4. Please follow with me in your Bibles. Psalm 23, verse 1 to 4. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This text here tells us, this passage tells us that we need to be comforted because of our fear. We all face different fears in our lives. And we need God to comfort us. And specifically, uh, we are afraid, we have this fear of dark valleys. These valleys represent those dark and challenging times in our lives. And some of you might be coming out of one of those valleys at this point as we speak, and some of you might be going into one, and some of you might be right still going through one of those valleys, still walking through that. And so we all face those valleys, those dark valleys. When we go through those dark times, what makes a big difference to us is to have someone beside us, walking with us. You know, if a, a little kid is afraid, what, you cannot really say much to them. What makes a big difference to them is your presence there, right? As soon as the parent comes into a room or if you take them by the hand and walk with them outside, it's all better. Why? Because of your presence there. And the same is with us as Christians. As we walk through those dark valleys, what makes a big difference to us is to know that someone is with us. To know that Jesus is walking with us through those dark valleys. In Psalm chapter 23, as we just read, it tells us that we are not alone when we walk through those valleys. Our loving shepherd, Jesus Christ, is the one who comes along with us and he walks through those dark valleys with us. He does not abandon us at the sign of a danger. He is a trustworthy shepherd. He is not a hired hand shepherd, as Jesus speaks in the New Testament. He said a hired hand, when he sees the danger come, he does what? He abandons the sheep and runs away. Jesus is a trustworthy shepherd. We can trust him, and we know he will stick with us through those dark valleys. Even when the danger comes, he will still be with us. When we look at these first four verses in Psalm chapter 23, there is a very interesting thing that is happening here. In the first three verses, everything is positive, isn't it? The Lord is our shepherd, and he leads us beside still waters. It's all nice. And he, he leads us where? To the green pastures. It's all nice, right? Um, all of us like these times when we are by still waters and green pastures. We like those good times in our lives, right? We don't mind them. But then the path of righteousness takes a turn that we don't like. It leads us to a dark valley. We were in the green pastures, we were by still waters, and suddenly the path of righteousness leads us to a dark valleys, and most of us don't like that. We might get the impression, if you look at the first three verses of Psalm 23, we might get the impression from the first three verses that Christianity is the easiest religion there is. Just laying around in tall grass and drinking cool water, right? It's all good. It's the best religion there is, if you just read the first three verses. But you have, if you have been a Christian for a while now, or even if you're a new Christian, you know that that's not true. <laughs> you know that it's not always peachy and roses, right? You know that it's not all tall, nice grass and pastures and cool water. It is in our human nature to want to avoid those dark valleys, but as long as we are here on earth, and as long as we follow Jesus with all our hearts, we will go through the dark valleys. It's unavoidable. The shepherd never promised to take us over the valley or to take us around the valley. He only promised us to go with us through the valley. Amen? All of us would like to avoid those valleys. If you could fly over it or go around it, find a detour, we don't like those dark times in our lives. But Christianity is all about what we do and how we react when we go through those dark valleys. That's what it's all about. It's easy to be a Christian during good times, isn't it? It's very easy. It's much harder 
when we are tempted, when we go through our dark valleys. However, as I said, I want you to understand the life of a Christian is not always a dark valley. We don't want to fall into the other extreme. Some people want to have only the good part, and some Christians say, well, it's always bad and bad and bad. It's not always bad. Christianity is not always a dark valley. We might get discouraged and disappointed to hear that if I want to truly follow Jesus, I must be going through the dark valley at times. The text tells us that even when we go through the dark valley, the shepherd is with us. That means that we are not always in the valley because it says when we go through the valley. It means sometimes we are out of the valley, we are on the hill. And praise God for his presence during the valley, but also praise God for bringing us through that dark valley and bringing us up on the hill. Amen? Because Christianity is not always a dark valley. So I don't want you to get disappointed and discouraged when you go through those. I know, and I've talked to some of you in our church here, that it seems that in your life it has been only dark valleys recently. It's one after the other, things hitting you so hard that you seem that you want to give up. We need to continue trusting God. Now, even though the Bible tells us that the dark valleys are unavoidable, you can count on them. They will come. They're unavoidable. Also, the Bible tells us that they're unpredictable. You can't plan for them or the time when they will come, right? It usually those dark valleys come when you don't really want them and you don't expect them, right? So they're unpredictable. And the Bible tells us, even though the Bible tells us that they're impartial, it means no one is immune from them. Everybody, rich, poor, whatever your status in the society, it doesn't matter. The dark valleys will still come. Even though they're unavoidable, unpredictable, and impartial, the dark valleys, there is a good news in the Bible too. Because the dark valleys, as I said, they are temporary. They don't last forever. And that's where we take courage and have hope. They're not our permanent residence. Someone said dark valleys are like a tunnel. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Some of us might ask the question, but why do we have to go through dark valleys? And that's the question I'm being asked quite frequently. Why do we have to go through those dark valleys? It is because dark valleys have a purpose. I know it is hard to really acknowledge and understand that while you're going through that valley, but this is what the Bible tells us. We go through those dark valleys because they have a purpose. God has a reason for taking you through that dark valley. Whether you have a valley full of doubt, despair, discouragement, disappointment, or defeat, God has a reason behind it. And don't ask me because I don't know it. (laughs) Some people ask me, why do I go through this? And I tell them, I don't know. Only God knows. And maybe at some point in time, after we went through that, and looking back after maybe many years, We will see the purpose, why we went through that. But at the time when you go through that, you can't see it. I can't see any purpose in us going through COVID. I can't, all right? And people experiencing dying and people having all these bad experiences and, and all of the things that we have to go through. And I don't see a purpose now. I might have an idea I might try to find one, but God does have a purpose. And he will reveal it to us in due time. If he doesn't, we just need to continue trusting him. That that dark valley has a purpose for you. Now, our natural landscape here in Alberta and in many countries, I come from Moldova, and in Moldova we have a lot of valleys and hills. It's just a whole country, valleys and hills. And so the natural landscape is you have a valley and you have a hill. You have a valley, so it, it's natural, all right? And, and so as valleys are a natural part of the landscape that we live in, so trials are a natural part of our spiritual landscape, our spiritual experience. It's just the way the life goes, and they do serve a, a purpose. We always want to be comfortable in our lives and not experience any affliction, and that's normal. It's human nature. 
But that is not the way our Christian experience works. We must accept that affliction is a part of our Christian experience. George Sweetings, he says this, God often comforts us not by changing the circumstances of our lives, but by changing our attitude towards them. All right, and that's we need to understand that they're natural. They're naturally, there will be afflictions, and we just need to change our attitude, how we look, and how we go through those times of trouble. A man stopped uh, to watch a little league baseball game, and he asked one of the youngsters uh, what was the score, and the little kid said, "We are losing 18 to nothing." Well, said the man, I must say you don't look discouraged because he was happy about it, the little kid. We're losing, 18 to nothing. <clears throat> discouraged, the little kid said. <laughs> Why should we be discouraged? We haven't come to bat yet. <laughs> you see, the attitude changes everything, doesn't it? It changes everything the way you look at it. Yeah, we're in the first inning, we, it's 18 to nothing, but we are still in the game. Because it's our turn to be at bat, all right? And so <clears throat> when we go through those dark valleys, it's all about how we, it's all about our attitude. And so God wants us to have this type of attitude uh, when we go through our valleys. The way we react to those times when we go through the valleys will determine our ultimate destiny. As I said, it's easy to go through, you know, all these uh, good times but it's much harder to go through the dark valleys, and we have to have this positive attitude about that. Psalm 23, verse 4. Go on to verse 4. <clears throat> Psalm 23, verse 4 assures us that while we're going through our dark valleys, God will be with us to provide comfort for us. Now, the text says that God is using a rather unusual instrument to comfort us, the rod. <laughs> Have you ever seen anybody being comforted by a rod? It's a very unusual instrument of comfort, I must say. Usually, <laughs> when we think about a rod, there are many objectives that come to our mind that are used to describe it, but most of us, for most of us, comforting is not one of those adjectives. Most of the times, we associate the rod with what? With punishment, don't we? <laughs> Kids know it well. <laughs> Those who grew in old times, sorry, old times, all right? I know it well. <laughs> the kids today don't. <laughs> we always associate it with punishment, but here God says that I will comfort you with my rod. In cases of distress and trials, we look for comfort and help in many different places. Some people find comfort in a favorite food, you know, and they start eating a lot. Um, some people find comfort in a favorite object or favorite song in nature, a favorite book, an inspirational text, or the embrace of a someone close. We always try to find comfort in something. These are all good things and can bring temporary comfort to you, they could, but we can find only the ultimate comfort only in God. Only God can bring that ultimate comfort that we're looking for. All of the other ones are just temporary and they will take the pain away for a while, but then it will come back. We need to seek comfort in God. Second Corinthians 1 verse 3 and 4, if you have your Bibles open with me there, Second Corinthians <coughs> 1. Verse 3 and 4, beautiful words that Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and to us today. <clears> he <throat> says this, verse 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of what? Of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So why are we going through the troubles and tribulation in our lives? This text is clearly telling to us. Because while we're going through that, 
we can be comforted by God, and then we learn things from that experience, and with that comfort that we experienced when we went through trials, we can comfort others when they go through their trials. You see that connection there? God allows those trials, those dark valleys in our lives, and then he comes and comforts us with his perfect comfort, and then we learn from that. And we have that comfort to give to others and offer it to others when they go through trials. Now, in order for us to understand the symbolism of a comforting rod in, chapter, in Psalm chapter 23, verse 4, we need to look at the function of the shepherd's rod, all right? What was, what was the function? How was the shepherd using the rod and how it can be comforting to sheep and then comparing to us today? We need to understand how the shepherd used it. Now, and I want to make a parallel while we go through those. There are three main main usages of the rod in the Old Testament by a shepherd. While we go through those, I'm going to parallel them to the Holy Spirit, all right? And you, you will see the parallel there between the rod in the Old Testament and between the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. It's a very interesting parallel there. So let's look through that. But before we do, in, first, uh, in John chapter 14, verse 16 to 17, Jesus says this, I will pray to the Father that he will send you what? Another what? Comforter, right? So you already see the parallel there between the comforting rod. God uses the rod in the Old Testament to comfort us. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the comforter that God is using to comfort us. So he said, I will, use, I will send another comforter, the spirit of truth. It's this word, Greek word parakletos that is the comforter here. And it means the one that comes alongside to help you. So it's the Holy Spirit that come, uh, comes alongside to help us and comfort us while we go through those dark times, all right? So let's look at the three main usages by the, uh, by the sh uh, shepherd of, uh, you know, uh, the usages of the rod in the Old Testament, and then we'll compare it to the Holy Spirit. The first one is guidance. The, the, um, the shepherd in the Old Testament used the, the rod for guidance to correct the course of the sheep. So what happens, often the sheep will uh, wander off, right? They will go astray, and, and so, um, and usually the sheep are very interesting they, they get distracted by things in the periphery, right? They don't look straight ahead. They, they get distracted. Uh, that's why the Christians are compared to sheep, okay? <laughs> that is why. Because we get distracted very easily by everything that's going around. And so one person, get, one sheep get distracted. What it, does, it starts going off the course. And then the other sheep do what? Start following that sheep. And they all go off. That's how sheep operate, Okay. That's why they use an interesting word for sheep. You are as, you know, as a sheep, right? I don't want to say the word. But it's, that's the way sheep are. They're very naive, so to speak. Very easily uh, you know, taken off course. And so the shepherd would have the, the rod in the hand to do what? To gently correct the sheep to come back on the path. All right? He doesn't hit the, sh the sheep hard. Some of them probably do. Those are bad shepherds. But gently guiding and correcting the sheep to come back on the path. Now, guidance always requires correction of direction, right? When you guide someone, they might go off of that path, so you correct them gently to put them back on the path. In Proverbs 13, 24, and a lot of you know this verse, the Bible tells us about the usage of the rod as an instrument of discipline and correction when applied to the children, right? Right? What does it say there? Do not spare the rod, right? In correcting and disciplining the children. Now, God does the same to us, all right, this correction. And it's used mostly in the terms of guidance and correcting uh, our children. God, as our Heavenly Father, does the same. He uses the rod, metaphorical rod, because He cares for us. He disciplines us to bring us back to our path. If he didn't love us, 
he would let us wander off like sheep and go over a cliff. Why would he care, right? He disciplines us and he guides us only because he cares for, lo- for us and loves us. That's what we do with our kids the same. If I didn't care about my child, why would I care if they go off and wander somewhere? I wouldn't. But because I care, I tell them to stay on the right path because that's going to bring them to eternal life. It's going to bring them to success. So that's why God does that with us. Now, this was the state of Israel when Jesus begins his ministry. Uh, the, the Bible says in Mark 6:34, we read there, it says that Jesus saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without what? Without a shepherd. That they were without direction. They were without guidance. And without direction and guidance, we're in a constant state of confusion and despair. And so when Jesus saw that, when he came, um, the spiritual leaders of that time were not guiding the people on the right path. And so that's why they were like sheep without a shepherd. Don't we see that confusion and despair in our world today as well? It looks like almost the same. It's like sheep without a shepherd. God uses his rod to guide us and correct us and discipline us because he loves us. In John 16, verse 13, now comparing the rod to the Holy Spirit, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit's role, however, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will do what? He will guide you in all truth. You see right there, the parallel. In the Old Testament, the shepherds used the rod to guide the sheep and correct them and bring them back. In the New Testament, the rod, God's rod is the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit today to really know the whole truth. Without the Holy Spirit, we might get lost very easily, and we do get lost. We as sheep sometimes go astray, but Jesus gently corrects us through the Holy Spirit. He puts us back on the right path. Now, we as humans, we don't like correction, do we? (laughs) We don't like discipline. But God uses that to do what? To bring us back on the right path. It is comforting to know that the Holy Spirit keeps us on the right path, isn't it? It is comforting to know that we have such a guide, the Holy Spirit, to guide us on the right path. So that was the first one. The rod was used for guidance and correction. The second one, the the rod in the Old Testament, the uh, the shepherds used it for protection. All right? And we see that very often. It was used as a weapon, (laughs) so to speak. Uh, The rod was used as a weapon against predators, animals, lions, and bears. And and David is a good example of that. And and we have all through the Old Testament the same picture. Now, the rod did indeed become a weapon, but it was not a weapon to to hit the sheep, but to protect the sheep. You see that? The rod is not to to damage and, and, and bring damage to the sheep but it's to protect the sheep. We need God to protect us with his rod today. We are under constant attacks from the enemy. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 tells us about Satan that he's like what? Like a roaring roaring lion seeking whom to devour, doesn't he? And so like a good shepherd, Jesus protects us with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we're in a spiritual fight. And the Holy Spirit provides protection and ultimate victory. Zechariah 4, verse 6. One of my favorite verses in the Bible says what? Not by might, not by power, but what? By my spirit, says says the Lord. By his Holy Spirit, that's our protection. That's our assurance of victory when we are facing trials and tribulation. Now, there was another way that the shepherds used their rods which goes along with the idea of protection, all right? Uh, yes, they used it as a weapon to kind of uh, fend the, the lions and the bears and all the other animals, but uh, there is another way that they used it. <clears throat> in the morning and in the evening, um, before going out in the morning from the fold and the sheep would go out with the shepherd, Um, they would go through a very narrow gate, right? And the shepherd would have the rod 
and, and it's called passing under the rod of the shepherd, right? Every sheep would pass and he would just gently touch it and he was doing what? Counting the sheep, all right? Why do you count the sheep? You know, you need to know how many went out because they won their way and when they come back, the shepherd does the same. He stands there with the rod and they all go through this gate and he does the same what? He's counting the sheep because he wants to see if all the sheep came back. He needs to know that. So, by this accurate individual count, every evening and morning, the shepherd could determine when a sheep was missing. That's why in the parable of the 100 sheep, remember that parable? When they came back in the evening, one was missing. And when one was missing, what did the shepherd did? What did he do? He went, he left all of the 99 behind and went to seek one. He wouldn't have known if the sheep did not pass under the rod for him to count each sheep individually. If there was one missing, one sheep missing, he would immediately go out in search of the wayward sheep to bring it back under his protection. Being out there on its own, without the shepherd's protection, the sheep was in great danger. That's why he went to seek for, the, for that one, to bring it back under his protection. Now, when we go astray from God, we are leaving his protection and we are in great danger as well. The shepherd had to count the sheep in order to see if all of them were present and to see if all of the sheep were, were his. Do you know that sometimes a shepherd might bring some sheep that are not his own? <laughs> you know, they get mixed up with some. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to um, uh, go in the summer to my grandma's village, and they, they, had, they didn't have sheep, they had goats. So every morning we had to wake up early, which we hated as kids. We had to take those, I don't even remember, she had three or four of them. And every, every other person on the street, uh, on that same street or whatever village had goats, and the kids would have to get up and get their goats. And so we would go, all of us together, and get them somewhere in the pastures. And we as kids didn't really watch them very well, you know? <laughs> and so when we come in the evening, we had to count them, but all of them had a mark or a brand, right? To know that that's yours, because you might bring somebody else's. The same was with the sheep in the Old Testament. They were, all of them were branded. They had a seal or a mark to know that that's, it belongs to that shepherd. Now, when we pass under God's rod, it means he counts us as his own. We belong to him. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, and this is why I want to make the comparison to the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, verse 13 to 14, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the seal, is the mark, and it shows that we belong to God. It shows ownership. Sealing is a sign of ownership and protection. God knows his people, and he'll protect them. And in the, this eschatological time that we see in Revelation chapter 7, we see there happening what? Sealing, and the four angels are holding the four winds, saying, do not let the winds blow until I do what? Until I seal all the saints, all right? And the saints actually were counted because it was a a specific number said there, what? 144,000. You see that sealing and the counting is very important in, in the New Testament as well. So in this eschatological time in the future, by the way, the blowing of the four winds is the same as, uh, as the outpouring of the seven last plagues in Revelation. So why do we need to be sealed during the, that time of outpouring of the seven last plagues and be counted? It's because God will protect his own. That seal that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit shows that we belong to God and shows that we are on the side of God, not on the side of the beast that is described in Revelation 13 that has a mark as well. Those people have a mark. We have a seal of God. It shows through the Holy Spirit that we are sealed for protection. God will protect us. The Holy Spirit is the one who protects the people of God, those who belong to him, those who are sealed through the Holy Spirit. Let's move to the last point. We have guidance by the Holy Spirit. We have protection. But we all, the, in the Old Testament, the rod was used to set sheep free from entanglement. All right? 
Most of the shepherds, they had rods that would have their circle. It was, it was like it comes straight and then on top it was a hook. If you see most of them in the Old Testament, if you see a rod, it had a hook on top. Why did it have a hook? It was very, it wasn't uncommon for sheep to get entangled and stuck in a thorny bush, right? So you can't go with your hands and what, what the shepherd would do would take that hook and hook the sheep and try to pull it out from the thorns. That's, that's what they did with, uh, with, with the rod. So in, in essence, the rod was used to set the sheep free from that entanglement. Uh, <clears throat> now, Jesus says in John 16, verse 8, that he will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, this is what Jesus says, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is the helper or the comforter, and the help that he is offering to us is to bring conviction. When we are stuck in sin, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction to us that we need to change. It's, that, it's like the prodigal son, remember when he was working with the pigs and eating that food, it was that aha moment. Why am I here when my father has everything? That moment of conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit working on the heart of the person to bring that conviction that he needs to change and go back to the father. And that's how the Holy Spirit helps us when we need that help. When we're stuck in sin, he brings conviction of sin. But the Holy Spirit cannot do it alone. It's, he can't do all the work for us. He brings convictions. He brings conviction. He points out that we are stuck in sin and we need to change. But then we need to desire that change. We need to ask God to help us change. When the sheep found itself stuck in the thorny bush and the shepherd wanted to help, the sheep could fight against the shepherd. Have you seen um, people trying to set an animal free from some entanglement? What do they do? They try to fight against it because they think that you're going to hurt them. And so with us, when we're stuck in our sin, in our entanglement, in bondage of sin, we have two choices. We either fight against the Holy Spirit to try and get away, or we work with this Holy Spirit and allow him to get us out of that entanglement. We have the same choice today. The question to you today that I have is, what are you stuck in today? What sinful ways are you stuck in? Jesus sets us free from the entanglement of sin through the Holy Spirit. You may try to do it yourself, but it will not work. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. The Spirit of the Lord brings freedom. That's the rod, that's God's rod that sets us free, the Holy Spirit. Let me conclude with this. We're talking about these dark valleys and how God's rod can really comfort us during those dark valleys, during those dark times in our lives. There was a little girl that uh, she lived near a cemetery um, <laughs> I don't know what about you, but I don't like that. You know, like, even driving by a cemetery sometimes can bring that, those <laughs> feelings. And, and listen, cemeteries here look nothing like they looked in Moldova. Really spooky and scary they look in Moldova, right? <laughs> so here they're very nice. They're arranged and organized. Some people even go for walks in the cemetery, you know? Uh, but if you went to Moldova, see our cemeteries, you would not go for walks there. But anyway, <laughs> so... <laughs> The same is probably in other countries of the world, all right. <laughs> but anyway, so this little girl, she lived near a cemetery, and often she had to walk through the cemetery after dark, and that's not a very pleasant feeling. When someone asked her, aren't you ever afraid to walk through the cemetery after dark, she responded, oh no, she says, I'm not afraid because I know my home is just on the other side, all right. I'm not afraid. I can walk through that darkness and not be afraid because my home is just on the other side. When we are going through the dark valleys in our lives, we can be brave because we know that, uh, that light comes at the end of darkness. 
But before we get to the end of the darkness and get to the light, we have an even better promise here in Psalm 23, verse 4. We have that promise that God will be the one walking through the dark valley with us. And that's the biggest promise and hope that we can hold on to today. We are facing, as I said in the beginning, all kinds of dark valleys in our lives. Financial valleys, relationship valleys, emotional valleys, and the big one, the COVID valley. We're all facing that dark valley. But we should not fear because God promised that he will use his comforting rod, the Holy Spirit, to guide us, to protect us, and to set us free. May God bless you. Amen.